Once upon a time, there lived a prince, and his name was not Hamlet. He was third in line for the throne. He wanted to prepare himself to be a good ruler, and he believed that a good ruler must be very educated and must keep his personal authenticity. That's why he isolated himself in a country house with a lot of books. He was reading all the time, all famous writers, scientists, philosophers. These years were the best years in his life. But one day, he realized all thoughts in his head, they were not his own thoughts. They belonged to all these famous people. Oh no, he got scared. He lost his own identity, all that external influence. He stopped reading immediately because he wanted to remove all other people's thoughts from his head. But it didn't work well, no. He lost his own thoughts also. His head became empty. The prince decided to start reading again. In fact, he spent all his life oscillating between reading and not reading, reading and not reading. He was trying to find a good balance between external influence and own identity. This prince lived in Orhan Pamuk's novel, The Black Book, and his story reminds me on an issue which we are facing very often, all of us relationship between expertise and creativity. When we are becoming a better experts, we are gaining knowledge and practice. And usually our creativity grows because we know more and we are getting more and more ideas. But in one moment, our creativity starts going down. Why? Well, when we are learning new things, we are building chains of associations. They help us to memorize things, and they are clustered around the domains of expertise. We use these chains in order to create concepts for solving problems within certain domains. But in one moment, these chains become associative barriers because they force us to apply all of the learned concepts on solving corresponding problems. You know, you're saying, I'm expert. I know that this problem will be solved in this way. So our expertise start to constrain our creativity. For example, you're building a software system. And you think, who is the user of the system? Human being, you're trying to be creative, and you think it can be a robot also nowadays. But your associative barriers constrain you in seeing a cyborg. So, what to do? How we can become more creative? Let's take a deeper look at the innovation process. Most of us, we are innovators, right? Maybe a few of us are inventors. But we are innovating things with our, our domains of expertise. And when we are combining different concepts and innovating within the same domain, it results in directional or incremental innovation where number of ideas grows linearly. And there are two problems with the directional innovation. The first is from the personal perspective, as I already said. If you're innovating all the time within your domain of expertise, your creativity will go down sooner or later. The second problem comes from the business perspe perspective. What happens with your product service offering in general if your company is applying only directional incremental innovation? Let's see the typical product life cycle described by S-curve. At company, your company, you find a new idea for a new product or new offering. Hopefully, you have already analyzed the market and assured that there are not so many other people doing the same. You introduce your offering to the market. Some time is passing, the market is growing. Other companies realize, oh, it's a good way, it's a good product, maybe we could do the same. The market becomes mature. All of a sudden, 
you found yourself, oh, but we are doing me two products. All other are doing the same kind of products. Market saturation is pretty high, and it feels like red ocean of competitors. And what do you do in such situation? At many companies, you're thinking, oh, we have to innovate. And then you are applying directional innovation, and you are just adding some new things on your value proposition. And what is happening? In fact, you are just extending, stretching this S-curve. But it will not prevent you in uh, uh, coming to that high market situation and red ocean of competition. And then if you ask innovation experts what to do, they will tell you, oh, you should find a new S-curve for your offerings. OK, it sounds logical, but how? And then you will hear that magic word, disrupt, 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 disrupt. And I know all of us have heard about the amazing stories about disruptive innovation, how uh, superior technology destroyed the existing one, as it happened with uh, digital photography. It's called creative destruction. Or how an inferior technology entered the market as a trial horse, but then transferred to superior one and replaced market readers, leaders. That's called the disruptive innovation. I know many of us have dreamt doing the same, but we know it's not so easy to disrupt. And also, disruption does not happen so often. It takes time with the disruptions. So how to find a new S-curve for our offering? To disrupt or not to disrupt? That is the question. And in order to find an answer on that question, let's take a look back at that directional innovation. As we said, when we are innovating within the same domain, we get directional innovation. But maybe we can do things differently. Maybe we can apply concepts from one, our domain of expertise in another domain that is completely different. For example, how did we get design patterns? Do you remember? When principles for building cities and houses were applied on software development. Swarm intelligence, the collective behavior of decentralized systems, which is used nowadays in artificial intelligence, we got inspired by insects and ant colonies, how they are signaling between each other, applied that on computer science, and got swarm intelligence. Serbian physicist Mihailo Pupin applied Lagrange theorem on telephone lines and got Pupin coils, which are still used in telephony. Richard Dawkins developed a meme concept and mimetic discipline by combining genetic evolution with the cultural behavior. Lean software development. Everyone is doing now lean software development. We got it when principles from Toyota car productions were applied on software development. And that's called the intersectional innovation. When you are combining two completely different domains and find intersections between them, usually by applying concepts from one domain where you are expert in another domain. There are a lot of benefits with the intersectional innovation. First, you get the exponential growth of ideas. It's a pure combinatoric. All of a sudden, you have a much more combinations to try. And furthermore, such ideas are usually groundbreaking and unusual because they are so different. Nobody combined these two domains in that way. Intersectional innovation is described very well in the Medici Effect book written by Franz Johansson. And the intersectional innovation is a powerful tool for us to increase our creativity. So, when we became a better experts, we don't want that our creativity goes down, right? So we should use our expertise as an advantage and try to find another domain where we can apply all of the learned concepts and get explosion of new ideas. Intersectional innovation also can enable non-disruptive innovation. 
which happens when you identify and solve a brand new problem or need. So instead of focusing on disrupting and replacing something, you just recognize the new problem, the new market need, and solve it. For example, coaching profession. It didn't exist 20 years ago. Now we have a lot of coaches, professional coaches, life coaches, agile coaches. It didn't disrupt anything. It just recognized the new need on the market and created a new market for that. How did we get there? By applying principles for, from sport coaching into another domain. The next example comes from swimming, since I'm a swimmer. Swim run competitions. Nowadays, it's very popular. Combination of swimming and running. It didn't exist 10 years ago. And now it opened a new market for sports equipment, type of competitions, type how you can train. So intersectional innovation is very good because it generates a lot of ideas which can lead to, to non-disruptive innovation, which in turn can help you in finding a new market under, beyond the existing industry, a new market niche or a new blue ocean. Oh, it sounds so great, right? But it seems that I forgot something. What do you think? Did I forgot something to mention? Yes, it's very inspirational. Intersectional innovation, generator for new ideas, non-disruptive innovation, blue ocean. But how can I know what is interesting for me among all these great groundbreaking ideas? What is relevant for me as a company, for my market, for my industry? What creates a value? So that's very important. Why are we innovating? You don't want to innovate just for the innovation's sake. You would like, you want that your innovation idea creates some business value. And how can we know which of all these good ideas generates a value for your company, for my company? We need help from the data because they can tell us a lot. Let's see how. What can you see on this picture? A lot of dots, but it doesn't tell you too much. If you zoom out, you can see a very nice Georges George Seurat painting. He was impressionist, and he used that special technique, pointillism, by putting a lot of dots on the painting and creating objects by that. So we can say all data that we are collecting, big data, it's a big data, but they don't tell us too much. We have to analyze them in order to recognize the objects. Here is boat or tree or lake on the picture. And it comes from, as you know, business analysis, uh, data analysis, business intelligence. And we, in that end, have a really very developed business intelligence and data analysis. And it uh, can even help you with the uh, some type of innovations, mostly for small incremental innovation. Because you can, you can have the machine learning and recognize, OK, it's good if I have a boat on the picture. Let's put another boat, the third boat, and so on. So it can uh, tell us how to uh, improve a little bit our offerings, our games. But we realize that we are missing something more in order to do some bigger step in innovation to find a new S-curve in our offering. It's the underlying message. What painter wanted to express by this painting? What will be his next painting? You cannot get that just by analyzing dots and objects on the picture. And it's exactly what we would like to uh, capture from an innovation perspective. Data insight. What is underlying needs? What is underlying message? And it's not only that we want to capture these data insights. We want to link them to business value so that we can get actionable insights, that we know exactly it's the reason why it's this happening. It should happen this way. And then you can derive your action directly. And of course, it's not a trivial job. 
But what we find out that there is one approach that helps us to capture actionable insight. You can guess the name of that approach. It's the blue ocean approach. In fact, blue ocean strategy is not only a business strategy. It offers a systematic approach how you can analyze the market, market trends, industry, and yourself as a company in order to get some ideas where and how you can innovate by non-disruptive innovation. Now, we are not going to go into details regarding the Blue Ocean tools. They offer a lot of uh, models, frameworks, and tools. I will show you just one snapshot of one tool uh, to show you that they are really having out-of-the-box thinking, as Stephen mentioned this morning. For example, if I ask you, why do you innovate at the company? You say, oh, we innovate because of our customers. We have a customers first. Is that true? In your company, do you say customers first? Or in your company? Blue Ocean strategies say something else. They say non-customer first, because they see, say that you have a current market and current customers. If you are focus only on improving things for the current customers, it's that then you are fighting against other competitors for the small set of customers. And then outside of that, you have an ocean of non-customers. You can divide them in three tiers. The first tier is uh, soon-to-be customers, customers that are standing on the edge of your industry. They're almost entering that but they're still not there. The second tier of customers are customers who are aware about your industry and your offering, but they're refusing in using that for some reason. And then you have a third tier of non-customers, customers which don't even know that you exist as a company you're offering, maybe not even your industry. Then you analyze and define all these three tiers of non-customers and think, oh, look at this tier. It's very big. Maybe we can add something to our offering in order to untap this ocean of non-customers. And then it's interesting because then you can combine this blue ocean tool with the intersectional thinking and think, maybe I can combine my domain with this another domain, and then combination will untap this tier two of non-customers. So it was uh, just a short snapshot of one of the Blue Ocean tools. And now we are approaching the most exciting moment in my presentation. I know that you have been waiting for that since this morning, because now I'm going to reveal the innovator's recipe. Are you ready for that? Yes, OK. There are four important ingredients. First is intersectional innovation search for intersections between domains. They are gold mines for new possibilities. Then, instead of focusing on disruptions and distracting things, focus on non-disruptive creation. Of course, use data and data-driven innovation and data-driven approach as much as possible. It really can help a lot with the directional incremental innovation that is also necessary to be done, but it's not enough. You should have a systematic approach to capturing actionable insights, for example, by using Blue Ocean approach. So four important ingredients, and it was only our prescription. If you need a doctor appointment, please come and talk to me. <laughs> Thank you for your time.